But my name is Connor, and this is my wife Jess, and my brother slash spiritual son slash partner in the gospel, Damien. His wife is at home, um, and we've got some of our daughters in the house with us, champions. So if you want prayer for healing, they're available. Um, <laughs> love them. But we, we uh, lead 24-7 church with my, my parents, and it's been such a privilege. And in the last little while, we've just seen the Lord open up um, the 1040 window which is uh, basically a, an area, a whole group of nations that are the most unreached nations on the planet. What it means to be unreached is basically these people have never heard his name. Uh, they, they haven't even had a, a chance or an opportunity to reject Jesus. They don't even know who he is. Um, the fact that we still have that today on the earth is a big deal. 3.14, estimated 3.14, 3.2 billion people on the earth that still do not know his name. So we just decided to care <laughs> because we, what we did was we found ourselves seeking the presence of the Lord. And as we were seeking his presence and going after his heart, we started to feel what he feels and burn for what he burns for. And then it was not just the lost in our city, which we burn for with a passion, but it was suddenly, there's also people on the other side of the world that nobody's thinking about. Nobody's going, nobody's, uh, you know, paying a price to go and see these people saved. And so we've just, as a community, because it's not going to be one or two people or just a ministry, it's going to take the body of Christ, the bride of Christ to finish the Great Commission. And so we've just really gone after that and said, Lord, teach us how to say yes to the kingdom of heaven, not just yes to services. We love services. Oh, we really do. We love our gatherings. Um, but it's more than that. And so I just want to share something that I pray would so equip you and encourage you this morning as a house. Um, and it's, this is an apostolic house. There is a grace on this house for church planting. In fact, it's, I'm a little jealous uh, because you guys do it with such grace and such ease. And sometimes we feel like we're trying to pop out little grapes. Um, but you guys just seem to just launch these, these churches, and I love it. It's because God's called you to be an apostolic house that will reach the Western Cape, which you're already doing. God's expanding you. I love that word of Joseph to the nations. That is a, that's a now word for your church to lean into because you're reaching the Western Cape, but there's coming a time and it's now. God's preparing you and shifting you as a church and it's going to take all of you. It can't just be a group of leaders or a handful of people that catch the vision, that catch the dream. As the bride, as the body, as the house, as a local church, we've got to catch God's heart for this moment right now and ask Him the question, what is the right response to this moment? And that's why we give, that's why we sow, that's why we serve, that's why we lay our lives down, that's why we go on mission trips, that's why we worship extravagantly, that's why we share the gospel on the streets, that's why we do what we do, because we're in love with Jesus, and He has a dream, and we're living to see the dream of God established on the earth. Amen. So, I want to just uh, share a few things around uh, a beautiful, beautiful church that we read about in the book of Acts, which is one of the most profound and significant local churches that we read about, and it's the church in Antioch. How many of you have ever heard that church in Antioch? Acts 11, Acts 13, awesome. So you can turn to Acts chapter 11. Um, Jess and I, we have just come back from the Middle East. We spent some time, uh, is this, this isn't being recorded, this one, hey? Oh, it is. Okay, cool. No, no stress. That's all right. We spent some time in the Middle East, and we ended up uh, having the privilege of being in uh, a city called Antakya, which is Antioch. That's all right. I won't give any details. Yeah, thank you. Um, we spent some time in this city called Antioch, and it's a really, really special place. Uh, I was standing in this valley looking at these mountains, and all I could think about was Paul was here. He was looking at these mountains, and I'm looking at these mountains. And uh, anyway, I was there, and I ended up having this beautiful moment where we were walking through the streets and we found this little like antique shop and uh, it had like all sorts of things soaps and then you know typical and my wife loves that so we went in there and then it had all these little uh, ornaments and beautiful things so we're looking around and Jess is looking at all the cool things and I'm kind of bored you know <laughs> just walking around the shop and I see this shelf and on this shelf is this old massive key and I look at this thing I'm like wow that's that's a beautiful key and, but there's only one, and I'm thinking, I, I think that's actually just for decoration. I don't think it's for sale. It kind of looked like that, you know. But I was so taken by this key that I asked the, the shop owner with Google Translate, because she didn't speak English, uh, I said to her, is this for sale? And she said, hold on, and she phoned uh, the owner. And I don't think it, it was for sale. I think it became 
available because they were needing some money. And uh, she said, no, we'll sell it to you. And I said, well, what is it? And uh, she typed it into Google Translate and she passes me the phone and it says, the old church key of Antioch. And I was like, I want it. I'm here. We'll take all my cash. I need it right now. And the Lord spoke to me in the city of Antioch and he said, I am reawakening the apostolic culture of Antioch from Acts 11 and Acts 13. And so we came back carrying this message. Now, what is it about Antioch that's so powerful? Let me just say this. Without Antioch, we don't get the gospel. You see, because up until this point, the gospel was a Jewish movement. And Holy Spirit said, it's Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. But it took the church in Jerusalem quite a few years to actually catch that. It was only when Stephen was stoned and persecuted, and suddenly they were scattered, that they realized, hold on a second, this is for others. And then you see Philip in Samaria, and the gospel begins to fall on Samaritans. And and then you see Cornelius and the, the Gentiles, and all these things start to happen. And some of these people, which we read in Acts 11 from verse 19, are actually scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen. In other words, persecution hit the church and they were forced to start living God's dream. (laughs) They got comfortable in Jerusalem. Now things, yeah, things were difficult. I take nothing away. You know, guys got mostly the, the apostles, but they got, you know, imprisoned and beaten and some things happened. But they hadn't left Jerusalem and the mandate was to the ends of the earth for love. And so persecution, I don't think God sent persecution, that's not what I'm saying, but the reality is there's something about the bride of Christ that thrives when everything else starts falling apart. And we're in that moment right now, when things get difficult around us, we're not of those who shrink back in fear, we're not of those who are intimidated by what's happening around us, we are like Antioch, seeing opportunity, though we may be scattered, though we can't pack out, you know, stadiums and fields like we used to, we're invading society. And so we see here in Antioch that those who are scattered, in other words, let me just explain this to you. Jerusalem to Antioch is far. To go from Jerusalem all the way up into southern Turkey on the border of Syria, that's not a casual stroll. You know, that's like, that's weeks. So you've got to be pretty scared to run as far as Antioch. So I want to I qualify you. These people were scared, fearful people running for their lives, but had just a little bit of faith, a little bit of boldness to preach the gospel. And look what God does with that. Here's a group of people, verse 19. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. So here's a group of people, they're still only speaking to Jews, but look what happens. I love this. But there were some of them. Men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, which are Gentiles or Greek-speaking Jews, uh, preaching the Lord Jesus. I love this. Some of them. Some people. We don't know their names. We'll never know their names till we get to heaven. But this small little group of people, just some people, just had a little bit of faith, a little bit of boldness to preach the gospel to those who hadn't heard it before. And look what the Lord does. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, He brought him to Antioch, and for a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people, and in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. Okay, let me show you something really really cool here. So, the hand of the Lord's upon this group of no-names, ordinary everyday people running for their lives. Hand of the Lord's upon them, they preach the gospel, and a whole multitude of people start getting saved, and the church is, is birthed in revival. So much so, can you imagine, this had to be pretty wild that what was happening in Antioch actually reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem. This wasn't just a couple of great Sunday services. This was revival in a city with a group of no-names who were just being obedient to the call of God, and suddenly Jerusalem hear about it, and this is what's so profound. They decide to send Barnabas. Why Barnabas? Well, in Acts chapter 4, 
we see that Barnabas is just this man in the, in the church who sees the need for the Great Commission, who sees the need for the gospel, and so he sells a field, and he lays it at the apostles' feet. Barnabas catches an understanding of the dream of God, understands that the right response is to give everything that I have to this dream, and because Barnabas sows a field, it qualifies him for nations. So Barnabas, years before this, just no name Barnabas, nobody knows really what, he's just a man who had a field, and he sold his field, and he laid it at the apostles' feet so that the dream of God, the work of God could continue right? Years later, that same Barnabas is sitting in a room with the leadership in Jerusalem, and they're saying, have you heard the news in Antioch? Who should we send? Who's going to carry our heart and represent the government of God, the leadership of God, the heart of his dream? Who's the right person who understands what it's going to take, the cost, in order to do this? Barnabas. And so they send Barnabas. Now, let me tell you something about Barnabas. Barnabas gets to Antioch. And now we know, Paul writes about this, and we know that when Paul came to Jerusalem for the first time to meet the disciples, they were, they were scared of him. Paul was pretty intense. So they were scared of him. But who went and fetched him and brought him? Barnabas. Why? Again, Barnabas is understanding something about the dream of God. So now when Barnabas goes to Antioch, he looks, at the, he looks at this community, he sees the grace of God. Listen to this, the grace of God upon the community. In Acts chapter 4, it says great grace was upon them all. And so what did they do? They sold their possessions. In other words, generosity, radical Jesus kind of generosity is the result of great grace upon a community. So what did Barnabas recognize when he came to Antioch? He was seeing the fruits of grace. This was a generous people. This was a people that were living for something bigger than themselves. He was recognizing the same marks of revival that he saw in Jerusalem, only this time it was bigger. It was wild. It was getting more intense. And then he does something so interesting. It says, when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. A great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas left and went to Tarsus. <laughs> I don't know about you, but can you imagine revival breaks out and Pastor Dave says, guys, now that revival is broken out, I'm just going to head off to Tarsus. <laughs> what are you doing, Pastor Dave? You can't leave. <laughs> If you think about it like, no, you can't leave. Hold on, you're the, guy that, you're the guy who's meant to cover this and lead this and be the face of this. No, 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 this is a move of God. But what does Barnabas do? Barnabas looks at this community in Antioch and he remembers a young man by the name of Saul who had an encounter with Jesus and God said to Saul that you will be an apostle to the Gentiles. And when he came to the disciples, I don't think they quite recognized that on his life at that time. So when it got tough in Jerusalem, guess what the, the apostles did? They sent him home. They sent him to Tarsus. So Barnabas had brought Saul, who we know is Paul, but at the time he was Saul. He introduces him to the leadership. Great, that's nice to meet you. Fantastic that you preach the gospel. Yeah, you can preach a little bit. He does. It gets intense. People want to kill him. And so their response is kind of like, go home. So he goes to Tarsus. And if you study it, it's, it's a, a round of about five years that he is in Tarsus. Now here's Saul, radical encounter with Jesus, life transformed. God speaks to him, calls him as an apostle to the Gentiles, and then sends him home for five years. <laughs> Go make tents. <laughs> Go back and live with mom and dad. I'm not saying you did this, but I'm extrapolating. You know what I mean? Go home. And I can imagine Saul was probably in this place of like, Lord, you said apostle to the Gentiles. That's the call of God on my life, and I'm in Tarsus. And I, I think Paul was the kind of guy who was just faithful. He's just faithful in the little things, just faithful in sharing the gospel with people in Tarsus, seeing God move, just faithful with what God had put in his hand. But it takes someone like Barnabas who recognizes a moment, and rather than looking for his opportunity to take that platform to take recognition, he remembers the destiny of God in a young man named Saul 
who others may not have recognized or called out of him. And he says, this is the opportunity for me to go and bring a son, a spiritual son, bring him into the context where he can come alive. See, what happens is people like Barnabas, spiritual fathers, and a community like Antioch, what they do is they fight for the destiny of God in people, even when they forget about it. They fight for the destiny of God in sons and daughters in the house. It's a place where the destiny of God comes alive for the purposes of God's dream, not yours. So let me say it like this. Paul is the reason these people are in Antioch. He's the one who approved Stephen's death. They scattered and ran in fear because of his brutality. Now Barnabas has gone to fetch him and bring him into the church. Can you imagine? This is how I share it. They bring it, Paul, Barnabas, I'm going to fetch this amazing gifted guy. He's going to be such a, an incredible asset to the church. It's going to be awesome. We'll be back in a few months. I'm just going to walk for the next two months to Tarsus to go fetch him. Goes and fetches him, brings him. Can you imagine that, that gathering? Barnabas, go, Paul, just stay behind me. Okay. Guys, I've got good news and I've got bad news. The good news is we've got an amazing anointed man of God who's going to equip us and train us and he's going to be a, just an asset to this church. The bad news is, it's Saul of Tarsus. <laughs> Can you imagine? But here's what's so beautiful about, about the, the community in Antioch. They chose to see the redemption of God, the dream of God in, in Paul, that they could receive from him, even though he had brutally persecuted the church and was the very reason they were no longer in Jerusalem. That group of people that preached the gospel for the first time in Antioch were only there because of the, the brutality of Paul. But they accept him and they receive him into the house. This is what apostolic houses do. You see, because what happens is they begin to uh, teach and train for a year. And that's the first place where the disciples, the followers of Jesus are called Christians. Why? It wasn't the name of the new religion that had been started in Antioch. It was a description of what these people looked like. So here's a group of people that are becoming a, a whole different way of life, a whole different culture in a city that's, that's, that's under a, a different earthly government. It's this Roman government that's, that's over this area, and suddenly there's a new culture, a new kingdom that's being developed in this community, and they look like that Nazarene who was in Jerusalem who said he was the way, the truth, and the life. So who was he again? Something, the Christ, the Christ. Well, these guys look like the Christ. So they must be little Christs, Christians. So now you see society named us Christians. We didn't name ourselves. Why did they name us that? They named us that because we looked like Him. Because we were, we were becoming the embodiment of the dream of God. And how do we know that this is the truth? People getting saved, healed, delivered. Ah, oh, man, there's so much, but we'll quickly. You need to come tonight. Okay, all of you need to come tonight, so I have more time to, to share this. But jump quickly to chapter 13. Verse 1, now they were in the church at Antioch, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Serene, Manaean, and a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now here's where it gets wild. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Verse 4, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went. Okay, here's what I want to say. Barnabas, Saul, a group, a dynamic group of leaders. If, you, if I had the time to unpack each of those characters, this is a dynamic, multiracial, different giftings. It's a, it's a diverse, incredible group of leaders, right? And then it says that they were, they were praying, or, or praying and fasting, ministering to the Lord. Your translation might say worshiping, serving the Lord. And I went and looked up that word, and it's litogeo in the Greek. And litogeo means a priestly rhythm of life. Here's a community of people that understood how to live as priests unto the Lord in His presence. 
here's a group of people that understood the corporate expression, not just my individual little thing where I've meant to, I can have my times with God and it's wild and beautiful. Yes, you're right, but that's not his dream. His dream is not just you in your closet, while that's a part of it and it's perfect. His dream is the bride of Christ, the multitudes of heaven coming together to minister to his heart for all of eternity. And Antioch understood that. So when we pray prayers like on earth as it is in heaven, it does look like the people of God gathering to worship him. It doesn't look like all of you doing your own little thing. It looks like a togetherness, a unity, a pursuit to minister to his heart. It looks like a people that understand I will pay any price to touch God's heart. It matters to him when we come together to worship. It matters to him when we understand that we're a priesthood, not just a bunch of individuals, but a group that are priests unto the Lord, a bride for his glory. And so they begin to catch this. And so what they did was they devoted themselves to his presence. See, Antioch touched the nations not because they tried to. Antioch touched the nations because they went after the presence of the Lord. You become a people that value the presence of the Lord. You go after his presence. Suddenly you begin to catch his heart. And when you catch his heart and you fall in love with him, you'll do anything for him. Another thing is that when you go after his presence, you create context for the leadership and government of the Holy Spirit. So what happens is they go and begin to uh, worship and minister to the Lord and they're fasting. And then the Holy Spirit said, can you, can you see what I'm saying here? When we go after his presence, when we're devoted to his presence, we create context for the perfect leadership of the Holy Spirit to govern the church. It becomes the context where the Holy Spirit can say, and then we obey. Where we don't live out of presumption, because you see presumption, and so much of our Christian life is based on presumption. Presumption is probability. I'm pretty sure God would want this. I'm pretty sure God would want me to get that promotion. I'm pretty sure God would want me to buy this new house. I'm pretty sure God would want me to do this, do this, buy that new thing. Whatever. You catch what I'm saying? We, it happens in church life. I'm pretty sure God would want me to go to the second service. I'm pretty sure, or I know when I'm leading the meeting, I'm pretty sure God would want me to say this. No, come on. Go after his presence. Devote your heart to him. And when we do that, we create context for him to speak. And then God becomes the leadership of the church. And then the perfect leadership of Jesus is expressed through the leadership in the church. Because by the way, we're a body. The government of God is expressed in the house. But his perfect leadership will be expressed through his divine order and structure in the house. It's a beautiful thing, but it's got to be him. It only becomes man, man-made and messy when it's us and not him. But when we seek his presence, we create context for God to speak. And when he speaks, we can obey. And it's interesting because he does speak and he says, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. That's a statement that if you're not a people uh, gathered around his presence, going after the dream of God, that's a reason to leave the church. You're telling me Pastor Dave and Pastor Sean are going? No ways. I'm done. These people, they don't, do they even care about me? How am I going to get fed? Right? That's how we think sometimes. No, no ways. That might, that's the whole reason I came to KLC. Ooh, did that come out of my mouth? I thought you were here for the presence of the Lord. I thought you were here to be a part of His dream. I thought you were here to equip the body with God's put, what, what God's put in your life to contribute to His dream, to see His kingdom established. I thought that you were actually excited to be a part. If we get to send and commission people, it's my absolute joy and privilege to be a part of commissioning and sending you because whatever I'm a part of, I get the reward of. So I might not be the one who puts my feet on or for example, Jess and I may be called to go to places that you don't want to go to. I don't either, but they're great. Afghanistan or Syria or whatever. We might put our feet on that soil and you might say, well, I don't feel like God's called me to do that. But, but when we as a body come together and we become a part of something, then you get that same reward. Pastor Dave and Pastor Sean might end up in countries that you'll never go to. 
But one day you'll get to heaven and a Mexican will walk up to you and say, thank you for the gospel. And you'll say, I'm sorry? And they'll say, no, but you sent Pastor Sean who preached the gospel to me. I gave my life to Jesus. Thank you for sending him. I received the gospel because of you. Are you with me? This is what an apostolic house looks like. So now, isn't this interesting? Here's a, a group of people ministering unto the Lord. Ministering unto the Lord. Ah, oh, we can do that. Worship today, we could have, uh, uh, there's a couple moments I thought, can I ask them, can we just stay? Because what we hit there at the end, there is revival on your voice, man. Like when you sing, I'm just like, I feel like I'm, I'm going back into old school revival. Not old school, but you know what I mean? Like that, that, that weighty revival. Like I felt like I was in a revival meeting this morning, just going like, whoa, if we, if we just linger here, I feel like I'm going to explode. So now we can do that. It's our joy to minister to the Lord. It's only boring when we don't know Him. It's only boring when we stop looking at Him. So now when we learn to look at Him, ah, oh, it's a joy. Even though I'm still drinking my coffee and waking up, my eyes are still stuck together, I'm there, but His presence is here. It doesn't cost me much to love Him, even if I look like I'm in a coma. It doesn't take me much. I can love Him. So here's a group of people doing that. And in that context, the Holy Spirit speaks, commissions. Now they're becoming this apostolic house because they've learned to be a people of His presence. We cannot be apostolic until we learn to be a people of His presence. How will we take the culture of heaven anywhere else if we haven't learned to value that culture here? Because apostolic, it means to be sent out. How are we going to send if we haven't built? And they don't have to happen separately. They happen at the same time. But now listen to this. The Holy Spirit commissions them, says, set them apart for the work to which I've called them. So guess what they do? This, isn't, this is beautiful because what you, what you don't see is Barnabas and Saul. Thank you so much, guys. High fives. Really appreciate it. It's been a wild time. And we'll see you in a couple years. Off we go. Guess what they do? The call of God, the commission of God, the instructions from heaven have come. And their first response is this. Then after fasting and praying... They laid their hands on them and sent them off. The call of God comes, the word, the instruction of the Lord comes, and their first response is back into His presence. Because what we are called to do as the church, finishing the Great Commission, seeing the dream of God established on the earth, it must be birthed in His presence, sustained in His presence, and completed in His presence, because He is the goal at all times. There's so much more I want to say, but I'll stop there. Let me just, let me just leave you with this today. <laughs> Sorry. Come tonight. Yeah. Let me leave you with this this morning. You have an opportunity as a house. 8 a.m. service. You have an opportunity to say yes to the dream of God. You have an opportunity for your little life to mean something so much more than comfortable surviving on the earth to mean something more than ticking the boxes and trying to just get through this miserable time you have an opportunity to say yes to the mandate of heaven on the earth suddenly when you begin to become a part of god's dream and you connect to the flow that he the movement of the holy spirit on the earth when you connect to that your reason for going to work changes Your reason for getting a salary changes. You start to ask questions like this. Lord, why did you give this to me? Instead of, Lord, now that I have this, can I? Because, see, stewardship, you don't own it. <laughs> but you don't know how hard I worked. I'm sorry, I didn't realize you were the one who put breath in your lungs. I didn't realize you were the one who gave you intelligence, gifting, ability. I didn't realize that you're the one who woke yourself up. Actually, no mercy woke you up today. You're alive because of Him. When we catch this, now I go to work and I'm, I, I'm about souls. The fact that I get paid to do a, a job that's a vehicle to reach souls is a great privilege. And now that I get paid to do that, Lord, why did you give this to me? What would you like me to do? Because it's like, no, well, I've paid my 10%, now it's all good. <laughs> you don't pay tithes, you bring tithes. It's not yours. But if he has the whole thing, then you see what, what happens is you become a people 
where God can make you a multimillionaire today and ask you to give it away tomorrow and you haven't even flinched. Because you're just given to his dream. Damien and I make this statement a lot. If Jesus is all that we need, I mean, how many of us have sang songs like that? Lord, you're all I need. Well, if he's all that you need, then he's already provided. So whether I have multiple millions in my account today and 50 rand tomorrow because I sowed it and he told me to, I have absolute confidence in the person of Jesus to take care of me, take care of my needs, because if I'm alive on the earth today, if I'm breathing oxygen on this planet, it's for his dream. It's for his dream. And the beautiful thing is he takes care of you. So you see, the reason why we look at these communities and we see such generosity is because they understood the grace of God. They understood that when I sow, that's not the end of it. There's more coming. But it's all under the lordship of Jesus. It's just simple obedience to the word of the Lord in our hearts. So we have an opportunity. I'm, I'm saying this. I'm using money as an example, but I'm not, my preach is not on money. My preach is on your heart today. I'm saying if you catch the heart of God, then what we become is a community in this valley, in this area, this region that will not only touch the Western Cape, will not only touch South Africa, not only the continent of Africa, but to the ends of the earth for love. And it only takes a few who simply say yes. Not sing yes, not just lip service yes, who say yes in their hearts, make a decision to give him their yes. And when you do that, he will honor you. And I'll end with this statement. If you will honor his presence with your life, he will honor your life with his power. I'll say that one more time. If you will honor his presence with your life, not your Sunday morning, your life. Honor his presence with your life and he will honor your life with his power. Will you stand with me this morning? There's an invitation to us to just say yes and to love him. And so I want to invite you to say yes to Jesus with me because I wake up every morning just like you and have to make that same decision. And it costs. But like I shared on, on Friday night, when we encounter the worthiness of Jesus, it stops feeling like a price or a cost and it starts becoming a joy. Will you lift your hands? Holy Spirit, I bless every person in this room. I release the manifest, tangible presence of the Holy Spirit upon every mind and every heart. And I ask that you would minister the truth of your gospel into the very foundations of our hearts, that we will be forever changed, forever transformed. Lord, we say yes to you as best as we know how, but we know that your Holy Spirit will strengthen and enable our yes and make it a roar within us, that you will be our strength to follow you, that you will be our strength to obey you, that you will be our strength to say yes when we don't know how. But Lord, we give you our hearts. Father, I ask now that my family in this room, though I may not know them all personally, they're my family in the kingdom. And I pray that they would feel the tangible love of God, the pleasure of the Father, upon them right now. I, I set them free and I release them from any guilt, shame, or condemnation. And I just thank you for the pleasure of God, the pleasure of the Father to come upon them now as they receive the gospel as good soil where the seed of, of your word can produce good fruit. Lord, we're going to partner with you to see the master plan of heaven established on the earth. And there is coming a day when we will stand together in the throne room of heaven and we will look each other in the eye with the biggest smiles and see the fulfillment of God's dream, His beautiful bride. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every people group reached with the good news of the gospel. Lord, we look forward to that day. We yearn for your return. beautiful King of glory, we bow before you. 
And we say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, we love you. We love you, Holy Spirit. Can you just love Jesus? I bless you guys. Thank you for receiving from us this morning. And we just want to say we love you. Um, my, my folks who are here, I think in December, they send their love. 24-7 Church in Joburg is praying for you guys. And we count it such a privilege to partner with you and run with you in the gospel. And we know we're going to see you guys much more in Joburg and here in the Cape. I think God's going to do amazing things. Love you guys so much. Thank you.